Right out of law school when I was in private practice, I had the opportunity to work on a pro bono death penalty case in Oklahoma. And um, that was really the first time I had been in a prison. And it was certainly the first time I had represented a, a criminal defendant. And I think that was the moment when I realized that really we have, as many people um, have noted, we have two criminal justice systems in this country, one for those who have means and one for those who don't. And um, after working successfully to convert his sentence, uh, we won a, a commutation to life without parole instead of the death sentence for our client. But I very quickly realized that that's something I felt passionate about and something I wanted to spend my, my career on. Why do I get all those letters? I think I get them because, um, first of all, most inmates have a lot of time on their hands. If they're lucky, they have access to uh, resources like a library. Um, and so many of them become actually very savvy and knowledgeable about sophisticated legal arguments. And so <laughs> they come across a law review article and think, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder if that would help me in my appeal. And, and so they reach out. I think a piece of it, though, is that people um, desperately want to feel that the world has not forgotten them. And that's a recurring theme in the, in the letters that I receive, that people say, thank you for saying we deserve a second chance. You know, we feel like we've been tossed aside as, like garbage and the system has completely forgotten us. The title of the book that I'm writing is called The War on Kids and the subtitle is How American Juvenile Justice Lost Its Way. And I call it that because um, it's true, we invented the juvenile court model. So late 19th century progressive era reformers in the United States quite rightly thought, well, kids can't be dealt with in an adult criminal court system. That just, for obvious reasons, makes no sense. So the juvenile court was invented, and the idea was that we will deal with delinquency, that is, criminal acts that um, would be uh, crimes if committed by adults. We'll deal with those, those crimes, um, that misconduct in a juvenile system. Children who come into contact with the system really are mostly in need of services, that they're in need of rehabilitation, that they are in need of education, social services of some kind. Um, and very quickly what happened is that developed nations around the world emulated that model, put in place their own juvenile court systems, their own juvenile justice systems, and simultaneously the United States began to abandon this distinction between juvenile and adult court systems. And that's obviously a quite complicated story, but, but in short, um, I would say there are two explanations for that. And one is that in the mid to late 20th century, the United States moved toward what's called a determinate sentencing scheme. So sentences went from being those that were discretionary for the judge to being those that were predetermined and based on the nature of the offense rather than the offender. And so you had this shift where we were moving toward harsher and predetermined or mandatory sentences. And at the very same time, we started giving prosecutors the power to transfer kids into the adult court system. And it's not even clear that legislators were thinking about what that would mean, but it was the perfect storm for kids. It put kids in the adult court system, and once there, they were exposed to sentences that were drafted with adults in mind.